So this is a webinar for the mentors for the career support group for the Association of Art Museum Curators and we're going to address strategic planning and how that takes place in a very basic way from uh, what, when, who, how, and where and I thought I'd let the um, panelists introduce themselves and talk a little bit about their background with strategic planning and then I'll <clears throat> say about my background and then we'll get going. So Jay, would you like to start? Sure, I'd be happy to. Thank you. I'm delighted to participate in this webinar today. Uh, my name is Jay Clark. I'm the Manton Curator of Prints, Drawings, and Photographs at the Clark in Williamstown, Massachusetts. And I'm also on the graduate program faculty at Williams College. And my participation in strategic planning has in some ways been more outside of the museum than inside of the museum. Um, I have served um, in part strategic planning having to do with the Clark in the last two or three years, but I've been more directly involved in uh, my former boarding school on which I serve as the Board of Trustees, so secondary school strategic planning as well as our local public library strategic planning. So all nonprofit, but just sort of of different shapes and sizes. Great. Sully? Yep, I'm Sully, uh, Robert Sullivan, and I've been in the museum business for 45 years now. Wrote my first strategic plan in 1972 at the Rochester Museum and Science Center and wrote my last one probably a week ago. So I've been doing this for a long time, at last uh, 20 years at the Smithsonian, uh, and find strategic planning to be ultimately absolutely necessary to run a project or a museum. So I'm glad to be here. Um, we've had lots of experience. I'm now running a business with Maria Elena Gutierrez called Cora. I thought I retired uh, some <laughs> eight years ago, but it turns out we're busier than ever. So, and many times it's doing strategic plans for clients. Great. And I'm Catherine Footer, and I'm the curator of architecture, design, and decorative arts at the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art. And the Nelson Atkins just completed a new strategic plan in the spring of 2013, and I was part of the strategic pl uh, planning team for that. And I'll just open it up to the fact that the former strategic plan for the Nelson Atkins was actually much more um, project-oriented and really talked about the fact that it was um, to build a building. Whereas our current strategic plan, which is available online, and I would recommend to all the attendees to look at various online uh, postings for strategic plans to see the variety of, the, of this um, document or how they uh, are formed, to um, the current one is much more uh, ideological, much more about engagement, about connectivity, and yet it has objectives and goals that we use really every day in the business that we do here, from uh, exhibitions to programs to um, all kinds of initiatives. So it's a d document that we use and refer to in many other forms. So why don't we start with uh, Sully, since you have so much experience, what is a strategic plan? And then Jay can talk about it from her point of view. Well, maybe start with what it's not and then back into what it is. Uh, it's not good intentions. Oftentimes you'll have uh, strategic planning retreats and strategic planning processes that end up with some very fine good intentions, or things that you wish you could do. Um, it's not a tactical plan. That is, it's not a plan that tells you what are the action steps required to achieve an outcome or an objective. That's a different kind of plan. What it does do is set some core directions that your organization is going to proceed in and some measurable outcomes that you can track progress with. So the general rule is if you're not measuring something, you're not managing it. So strategic planning is a way to agree upon some critical outcomes and results and then what characterizes and measures the success in those results. So it's a results oriented plan, it's an outcome oriented plan, it sets a direction and sets a target and then allows the staff to do their own action planning as professionals to figure out how they're going to get to that end state that the strategic plan sets out to achieve. Uh, the other thing a strategic plan must do is identify obsolescence. 
that it's oftentimes people do strategic plans that add many, many, many good intentions to the, uh, to the plate that the staff has, but they never identify instead of what. That is, if I'm going to do this bold new initiative, this new strategic direction, what are you going to take off my plate so that I have the resources and time to complete this new strategy? So many times strategic plans fail because they do not take into account what has to be declared obsolete in order to make the plan, the new plan and the new directions uh, work. Finally, a strategic plan has to reference capacity. And it's oftentimes strategic plans fail because they first didn't do a capacity analysis to see what the resources, skills, and, 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 and capabilities were in the staff, in an organization, to match that up to the strategic plan. When that doesn't happen, the strategic plan gets filed in a drawer, and five years from now you take it out, and you wonder at how quaint and innocent you were five years ago when you wrote all those goals, none of which uh, were achieved. So a strategic plan must identify obsolescence and it must be based upon the actual capacity of the organization to get results. Great, thank you. Jay? Um, I, I absolutely agree with everything that Sully said. It's, um, I feel like in the ones that I've been involved with, with, it's a very exciting and powerful way to recharge your organization. Um, you're all working together towards a common goal. I feel like every level of the staff ideally should have some input in the strategic plan, not necessarily in the, the final writing of it, but in, um, in questioning, um, survey monkeys, focus groups, subcommittees, things like that. It's a way to really recharge and energize. And I think ultimately it ends up being a, a kind of management tool, um, but that should be really at every level of the organization. So I think it's something that can be very exciting, but I agree that the level of obsolescence can also be very depressing. If you work on something strategic plan for a long period of time and it's not utilized quarterly, annually, the issues brought up at every staff meeting, but doesn't become a living, breathing document, then it can sort of feel like it was an exercise in futility. And in, in my limited experience, um, unlike Sally, who's been doing this for years, it's, it's a lot of work. Um, and it's, in my mind, it's always worth it. But if it's not used, then um, it can add to a, a level of staff uh, potentially frustration. Great. Good. So I guess the next question is when should it be done? So Jay, do you want to start with your experience? I think there's um, there's a number of different institutions that have to do it in a certain amount of time because if it's a nonprofit library or something like that, they're mandated by the state depending what state you're in if they're going to get state funding. Uh, sometimes it's driven by grant proposals. Um, they've asked you how long has it been since you've done a strategic plan. Um, I think in my experience most nonprofit boards, it can be every three years to every five to ten years. In my sense, uh, corporations, they tend to do it on more of an annual basis, but um, nonprofits, I think if it's done if it's done well every three to five years um, makes a lot of sense. I think sometimes it's helpful as an energizing tool if it's done, for example, right before a capital campaign or um, before or directly after a major building program, the Clark has just gone through major renovations. And I feel like, although we did a strategic plan five years ago, four and a half years ago actually, now would be a good time to do it again and say, okay, here's our existing campus. Now we know what it takes to run this campus and we should really reconsider the institution based on that. So I think there's, there's a number of different times it can be done um, and could be done. But I think more, I think annually, in, in my perspective for a nonprofit is just it's too much it's too labor intensive to really be able to do that every year but I think every three to five years would be ideal. Sully? Well I'd answer that in three ways. Uh, number one you should only do a strategic plan when you're ready to do it and, and that means you've got to have staff training, you have to do your capacity analysis, you have to have all of the pre-strategic planning work done and in place to be sure you're ready to do a strategic plan. Everybody has to value it, understand what it means and what the commitment to it means, 
uh, you have to build all of that kind of uh, foundation before you're ready to do a strategic plan. The second answer is you should do a strategic plan perpetually. That is strategic planning to me is a way of thinking in an organization. It's not a document. It's not something you put in a drawer. It's something that animates the entire organization on a regular basis. Everybody knows what the strategic goals are. Everybody knows what the strategic directions are. They've got their action plan that contributes to that. So it's a perpetual process that is constantly being renewed and, and, and used. Uh, that having been said, the reality is you do a strategic plan when the board or a funder asks you to. And I think that that hopefully is a wake up call for a staff that they need one. Uh, and oftentimes that's what motivates a director that somebody important to him or her has asked for one. And so they initiate a process to get one done. Uh, however, I also believe that you need somebody experienced in, in strategic planning to help you do that. It's not something every director knows how to do. It's not even something every board member knows how to do. So eventually I would hope any organization realizes that strategic planning is part of the DNA of the organization and has to be a perpetual set of activities. Great. Well, actually you lead right into who should be involved. And you talked about directors and boards. So do you want to continue, Sully, and talk about that? You know, the answer to that depends um, on the character of your organization. When you're doing a capacity analysis, one thing you look at is the internal culture of the organization. And some organizations are top-down, where a director likes to announce uh, strategic directions and outcomes and then persuade his staff that he or she is right uh, to pursue them. Sometimes you want bottom-up strategic planning because you're trying to build a team, you're trying to build high performance at the at the all the levels of the organization. So it depends on the character of your organization. A lot of organizations we work with, the staff uh, resent strategic planning. They don't want to participate. They think it's boring. They think it's not fun. Uh, they think it commits them to outcomes and measurement of their work that they're not comfortable with. So all of those things are preludes to the strategic plan and getting people uh, enthusiastic about doing it and knowing it's not a performance program, it's a guide for the organization's activities. I believe that it should be two levels of teams, a core team, that's usually three to four people who are going to author it and, and monitor it and get engaged and committed to it. And then a large, large input from across the organization. Everybody should feel that their input was respected and was part of the decision-making process in building a strategic plan. And Jay? Yeah, I agree. I, I see it as kind of a, a, a bit of a funneling system in the sense that ultimately whoever has to write the document um, has to be um, you know, either it's one person or it's two or three people as Sully suggested. I think it's ideal if you have the entire staff involved in one way, shape, or form, depending on how large the staff is, whether that's by surveys or departmentally. Um, you have a meeting where you have, you know, two, at the Clark we had, a, I think, a two, um, three two-hour meetings where the curatorial department got together and we talked about all the issues revolving the strategic plan. We gave all our feedback, which then went to, you know, a, a group of the, the management team, for example, and then funneled again. Um, and what the Clark ended up calling ours was Vision 2020. It didn't have the name Strategic Plan on it. It was really about plans for the future um, post, post renovation, um, although it was done before the renovation. Um, but I agree, there's, you know, it's some other nonprofit strategic plans I've been involved in. There can, you can really run into resentment. People saying, my job is so intense as it is, we're too short staffed, we don't have time for this. So I think there's a certain amount of buy-in um, that has to happen at every level for someone to be, um, be really involved. And I think if you're at an academic institution, for example, even some form of course relief um, or some reduction of duty so that you can very seriously attend to the writing of such an important, um, such an important piece. Um, I think also besides departmentally and with, you know, across the board and the staff, obviously the Board of Trustees has to be involved. And I also think it's important, especially for nonprofits who are not necessarily trained to do this kind of work or not trained in management skills, they just happen to have done well in their career, so they're in a managerial position, is to have outside consultants come in and really work with the team to, to do it the best way they can, since it does take a lot of time. 
Well, from my experience, we had everything from top all the way down to volunteers and even community members that had input. So it was actually quite widespread on who um, had input into the strategic plan. But again, being that it was going to be sort of about core values, and I think it was also about motivating people. If they felt part of the strategic planning process, that they would then, in the end, hold all the things um, the results and the objectives and goals that are held in it as already part of it. And also pointing out to them in the end how we've been living a strategic plan even before it really became a hard document that we used. So, and it had many consultants. I think there were times when many of us thought it was a little messy and there were so many voices that which one were we going to listen to, but I think that helped to tease out what were the essential objectives and goals that we could hold on to as an institution. And as Sully has pointed out, that flexibility that would allow us to, as an institution, to use the document and have it grow. So I think that there are many ways. I think sometimes pe some people use just one consultant. In our case, we probably used three or five consultants that came in and did workshops with various members of the staff and talked about different aspects of strategic planning and the goals of the museum. Catherine, can I ask a quick question? I'm curious, how, how did you get the community involved? That would be very interesting to learn about. Um, they went to, there were some meetings that were uh, pe people that we knew in the community, whether it was teachers to talk about how they viewed the museum and what the they valued about the museum, but then there were also the um, we are in a neighborhood, we are in neighborhoods, so some of those, talking to those people, how they viewed the museum, how what they saw the museum's future going to be and how they wanted it to be a partner and um, to make connections and in fact one of the goals came out of that was that we would be even better connected to our communities whether it's cultural institutions or whether it's neighborhoods and how that might be again how we would um, act on that in some way so I think that also fed through um, we had visioning exercises, we had small meetings, big meetings, we had all different size. So I would say it was a very long process, which gets at some point of sort of how you go about doing these. So, um, But going back to your sense of frustration is when was that thing going to, when were we going to have a strategic plan? And the group that was um, organizing it was often sending messages, you're already living it, don't worry about if the words aren't wordsmithed yet. So. Anyway, um, so it gets to how should it be accomplished, which I've touched on. And Jay, do you want to talk about some of your experiences? I think I sort of, I guess I go back to the last question, um, the sort of funneling system. Um, I found the one that I've been in, one that I was involved in, it took a year. Um, and this is, a, it's, it's not as large as a, as a museum, but again, a nonprofit. And it, I found it very valuable to work both with people involved in the day-to-day -day running of that particular institution or school or whatever it is, and then have people that are connected to the institution but don't work for them and aren't involved in the board, sort of like your community outreach. Right. Um, and I think that can bring a sort of awareness to an institution that we may not have when we're inside of it and we're working there every day. Mm -hmm. So um, I guess the most effective way is to have it exist on all different levels. So for example, you're working with your department, then you're working on a subcommittee, then you're working with the community, then you're working on writing it. So it's really, you have many balls in the air at the same time. And I personally, I felt the more involved I was and on the more uh, committees the better the document would be. And then it really does become a living, breathing um, strategic plan. And I think um, the level of enthusiasm, I thought it was interesting what, um, what you were saying about vision, sort of vision quest people coming in and getting the staff excited about it. The more staff buy-in there is and the more staff participation, the more, um, the more it can work. Sully? Yeah, I would, uh, let's not overcomplicate strategic planning. I think sometimes, as a consultant now in strategic planning, uh, you try to make sure the client understands this is not a very complex process. It requires you have an advanced knowledge of your current situation. 
as you really know where you're starting. We find strategic plans often fail because this, even the staff does not really have a good, hard, prophetic sense of what the present is and what the present commitments are. You then, where do we want to be three or five years from now? I would, I would suggest three years from now. And then how do we get there? I mean, that's all that a strategic plan is, and I think sometimes we make them too complicated, make the process too iterative, and everybody gets bored and angry and resentful, and it just doesn't work. So, but you do have to start with where you are. Now, some organizations have a very clear sense of what their current condition, situation, and capacity is. We find many do not. Many do not have a really good sense of what the performance capacity, skill set, internal relationships, external relationships, resources. They don't have a good, hard uh, way to understand where they are now. So oftentimes a strategic plan takes a year and you describe an unrealistic future uh, given what your present condition is. So I think you really have to start with how much does the current uh, leadership know about the current situation and capacity. If they have a strong sense of that, then a strategic plan should be no more than three months in the complete. Mm -hmm. If they have, do wow. not have a good sense of that, <laughs> sounds no good more. to me. <laughs> it sounds great. <laughs> uh, six months. If, if you go longer than six months, you're you're making good intentions. You're not doing strategic planning. The thing that often gets forgotten when in the present analysis of the present situation. People aren't sitting around with nothing to do. I mean, they're not sitting around with four more hours to dedicate to new strategic goals. So the current situation contains routine objectives that you must continue to achieve, and those never get recorded in the strategic plan. What gets recorded is what we would wish and desire to do if, if we lived in a perfect world. And then you don't capture the routine objectives that workers have to do every day, you come out with a strategic plan and they just say, when am I going to do this? I mean, when this, these are all new objectives. Uh, they would take another four hours a day. I didn't have four hours to spare 15 minutes ago. Why do I suddenly have four hours of additional to spend on the plan? So it, it really does come down to know where you are, clearly know in a measurable sense where you are, realistically where can you be in three years, and then what are action steps we can take to get there? and keep it simple, uh, keep it realistic, keep it doable, keep it useful and functional. If that's the plan you're doing, it should take no more than three months. I must say that that is very heartening because I've never been involved in a strategic plan that took less than a year. And there was probably way too much information gathered. And I remember we kept saying, well, we'll add this to the appendix. But how many people are actually going to look at the appendix? And then you're sort of losing the forest for the trees. There's way too many meetings, way too many conference calls. So it's really heartening to think from your extensive experience that it can be successfully accomplished in three to, three to four months. Well, you can walk into an organization and understand every organization has a status quo conspiracy, a group of people who don't want anything to change. <laughs> they like okay. it just the way it is, and they don't like centrally determined objectives that are going to, going to get in the way of them setting their own priorities every day, mm -hmm. coming in in the morning and deciding what they do. So every organization has the status quo conspiracy. The status quo conspiracy wants to hang you up in the information gathering stage because mm -hmm. it keeps you from making decisions. And so they'll hang you up in meetings and conferences and focus groups and all of these kinds of information gathering uh, activities that really in the end don't contribute a great deal to the strategic goals that if you asked your staff, they would say, I know what my strategic goals are. I know where we should be going. There's a lot of good information there. There's a lot of realistic information there. But too often the plan takes a year because you're tied up so long in useless information uh, gathering and second guessing, oftentimes orchestrated by a group of people who are going to ignore the strategic plan anyway. So it, it should be quick and decisive. And then, and then when three to five years runs around, if it's taken a year, the whole staff has a collective sigh and groan and says, do we have to do this again? Do this. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, I, I guess I would ask then if we have uh, senior curators who are our attendees, how do you um, advocate for the short version? Rather, that how can you... Um, maybe affect change so that you don't get into the year and a half 
strategic planning process. You want to answer that, Jay, first? <laughs> oh, I didn't know if we were if we were opening it up to outside write-in comments. Well, or let's start and see what. Okay. Um, I mean, I think it's it's having been involved in way too many that now I understand took way too long. <laughs> um, I think that's something you, that would be best discussed with the outside consultant because I think oftentimes directors and boards uh, and management, senior management, will listen to an outside person more than they will someone they work with every day. I'm not saying there's no level of respect, not at all, but someone whose clear expertise it is. And if the outside consultant really can push things along and be that be that advocate for keeping the process short, then, then all the better for it. The other thing I'd add, and many times these outside consultants don't know anything about museums including the board uh, and oftentimes the board and the outside consultants come in and it's we're going to whip this group into high performing condition and they're going to get a lot more uh, results than they're getting now because they just don't understand how much work it takes to do an exhibition how much work is involved in doing a successful public program they don't know museums and they don't know museum personnel they come in with a bad attitude. You know, I think these people are lazy. They're, they're, they're not performing enough. I don't see enough outcomes. I don't think they're doing enough, so let's do a strategic plan. That's a misassessment of the present. It's a misunderstanding of what kind of organization a museum is. It's a misunderstanding of the fact that an exhibit is the most complex creative product that you will ever produce. It's not the same as a computer producing a computer or an automobile. It is a much more complicated activity than that. So I, I would be cautious about especially corporate strategic planners who come in and impose a process and impose a way of doing things that is just toxic to the museum the staff that gets burdened with this, with this plan. And I think if it has too much of a for-profit flavor, you will immediately turn people off. And I think that's exactly what you're saying, yep. so that if you have someone from the outside who doesn't understand a museum or a nonprofit culture, it's, it's going to make the process much more difficult. Or, or the fact that you can measure quality. That is, everybody goes into strategic planning from the corporate side saying we're going to do this all quantitatively. It's all going to be measurable outcomes. It's all going to be progress and success measuring outcomes. I believe you can both have qualitative and quantitative outcomes and you can measure both if you are thoughtful and creative about the measurement process. But too often the outside consultants come in and say, can we please transform your work into numbers? Mm -hmm. And you're just looking at them saying, that's not the nature of our work. It's qualitative work. It's impact work. It's, it's hard to measure oftentimes in hard numbers. I'm a great believer in measurement and management, but I don't believe in the kind of widget management that often outside corporate uh, strategic planners try and impose on, on say, a curator. Mm -hmm. And I hope there are curators listening. <laughs> we agree <laughs> on curators. <laughs> More power to the curate. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> so how should the strategic plan be shared? Sally, do you want to? Um, if, if a strategic plan isn't part of the DNA of an organization, it becomes good intentions very quickly. Uh, mm -hmm. Stabs are very skilled at undermining and doing soft sabotage. I mean, they've been doing it many times for 20 and 30 years in their job, trying to avoid centrally determined objectives. Uh, so the staff has to buy in. You have to sell your strategic plan. Too often you do a strategic plan and you send it out to the staff and they write in the top right-hand corner, looks fine. If you get the, the plans back with looks fine written in the top right-hand corner, it means they could see no consequences in that plan for their work on a daily basis and therefore they have no problem that you put it into a drawer and call it a strategic planning process. So too often uh, you don't realize or the board and the director don't realize you have to go out there and build your coalition, build a support group that's going to implement and be enthusiastic about the plan. It's not automatic. And the minute you send it out it doesn't mean people are going to like it, respond to it, or even care about it, you have to go out and sell it. And you have to sell it on the basis of how it will improve the quality of their life and their work life and the outcomes that they achieve for their community. 
Uh, too often it's just kind of typed and you're so sick of working on it, you just type it, send it out and say, thank you very much, here's what our new strategic plan is, and people just ignore it. Okay. Yeah, I agree. Um, it's great. It, it's, it has to be obviously shared internally and with the board. Um, but I know one process in um, the high school that I, the high school um, strategic plan that I was involved with, <clears throat> they had suddenly declining um, admission rates. And so one of the things that we discovered as we were working on various components of the strategic plan was that A, we needed um, a, a, a PR person at the school. There was someone who did a number of different jobs. So I think ideally it can drive major changes in the organization. And then you can use that, you can use the strategic plan, maybe not the entire thing, but use portions of it as um, you know, a sort of PR, PR marketing device. Not necessarily, you know, again, you don't share the whole thing, but you have it as someone that's in the admissions office at a school or you know, at a library or Maybe somewhere it functions on a website um, of a museum. Of course, the nature of them is they tend to have a lot of confidential information. So you're not going to put the whole thing up wholesale. Um, strategic plans, because you can have a part of it. You know, usually in many websites there's a our mission, our goals. You can use a sort of shorthand version of the strategic plan so that outsiders can look at it and see that it's an organization that's changing and energetic and and vibrant, not just something that's you know the old museum with all this old art, you know. <laughs> that never changes. So I think the more alive the document can be and the more ways it can be used, um, then all that, you know, all that effort is, is very, very worthwhile. Well, as I said in the beginning, the Nelson Atkins uh, strategic plan is online and is a transparent document, so it doesn't have a lot of um, confidential information. And I think that it has been used as a PR tool and but also as an internal document that people can look at quite frequently. As I said, we refer to it in programming and exhibitions. So I think it's, it, in a way, it's a transparent thing that the community can see what the museum is trying to do and either can embrace that or say, I understand that that's part of their mission and their strate strategies for um, working with the community as well as internally. So, Sully? Well, I think... The key here is that when I received the strategic plan from my director, I recognized myself in it. I mean, I can see where I fit. Yeah. And, you know, we normally ask three quick questions when we go into a strategic planning situation. Do you know what it is that you produce? What's the final product of your work? And oftentimes you, you don't get good answers. You'll hear exhibitions, collections, uh, well-managed collections, secure collections. And you, you're not understanding that that's an interim outcome towards another key strategic outcome, which is the final product of your work. Do you know what the, what the final product of your work is? The second question is, do you have passion for it? That is, when you look at that final outcome, do you say, yes, that's why I got in this business in the first place. I want to achieve that outcome, that outcome I have have some passion for. If you get no answers to either of those two questions, don't bother doing strategic planning. I mean, you're just not ready for it. Your staff's not ready for it. And oftentimes that's the first shock when you, when, when, when you, we did a strategic plan for General Motors, say for instance, and we asked what's the final outcome of, of your work? And of course they all answered high performing, very efficient, well-designed automobiles. And we kept working and working and working with them. And finally, we got one of the people in the, in the planning session to say, repeat customer. Mm. That's our final outcome, someone who buys a second car, because they were so pleased with what we did with the first car that they buy a second car. So that's the final outcome. But here you were in a corporate setting, commercial smart people, and they really didn't know what their final product was, what the final success story was. Same could be true in a museum, you know, that, that, that the repeat customer is a measure of effectiveness. It's a measure of how well you did with the, with the first exhibition or the first experience. But oftentimes we struggle to describe what actually is the final desired outcome of our work. And that then sets the stage for strategic planning and who should be involved. But if the answer is I'm not sure, or my final product is monograph articles that are published in peer uh, reviewed uh, man magazines, then you're not there yet. You're not ready to do strategic planning yet. 
I had a question for you, Sally. I was really interested when you were talking about laying the groundwork um, among a particular staff or within the institution to get ready. I've always just jumped in feet first. What kind of groundwork are you, are you talking about? Well, a capacity analysis, say for instance, looks at seven features of an organization. It looks at your resources. How, how adequate are they? Where are the gaps? What kind of incoming and outgoing uh, resources do you have? Do you have enough money? Are your budgets big enough for your ambitions? A really hard, realistic assessment of resources. Second is staff. Do you have the right staff? Are they deployed correctly? Are they in the right places? Are your priorities driving your staff deployment? Or is tradition driving your staff employment? Are people who are here for 35 years, are they still doing the right things for your organization? Then you got leadership at the board and director level. Is this a good leader, a charismatic leader, somebody who shares core values and beliefs with the staff that they trust, respect, and have confidence in? Uh, is, is that in place? And those are tough questions that you have to ask yourself candidly before you start going into a strategic planning process. What's your internal culture? What kind of organization are you internally? How do you, how do you interact with each other? What kind of groups do you form? What kind of teams do you have? Are they high performing teams? Are they communicating well? Is the interdepartmental cooperation solid and good? So you look at internal culture. Then you look at external relationships. How are we doing with our community? Are we in touch with our community? Does the community support and know what we do? Do they know what our values are? Do they support and believe in those values? And so, so community or external relationships, professional relationships, do I have the right relationships with lending institutions, other scholars, other educators? Does my school system know and value what I do? What are those external relationships? And then finally, the one that we almost never look at is what's the operational model of your organization? Do you have the right performance model for your organization? Is it, is it to, oftentimes you walk in and, and into a situation where is a learning center the same as a museum? Are you considering yourself a learning center, a museum, an archival center, a research center? What's your model? I mean, what's your business model? And is that business model appropriate uh, for the outcomes that you want to achieve? So that identifies, that process identifies the gaps and the things that the strategic plan must address and must strengthen. But without knowing what your strengths and weaknesses are, without knowing and having good answers to those questions, you're really not ready to do strategic planning yet. And do, do you see the institution undertaking all that or is that really facilitated with a consultant so that you get the honest answers? When I was working in an institution, I would have said an institution has to do that. Now that I'm a consultant, I'm going to tell you a consultant has to do that. No, I, I honestly think, you know, I did strategic planning as a way of life when I worked at the Smithsonian and the New York State Museum. It was just my managerial style. But most directors and staff don't have time. I mean, they really don't have time to do a good, solid, well-written strategic plan that guides them towards the future. I mean, you have to give a lot of your energy to that staff as an outside consultant, and you have to be a colleague. You have to know what they're going through because they just don't. I mean, they don't have the hours and hours for all the meetings and retreats and everything else. Mm -hmm. So I really think, and, and plus the candor of a capacity analysis. I mean, we've done capacity analysis that infuriated the board um, and, and just infuriated the director because they were dead on candid assessments. Mm -hmm. And they said things that were never said in the institution, but were the causes of the problem of the institution. Mm -hmm. Half of the problem is unstated. You know, the, the, the educational staff doesn't share the same core beliefs and values as the curatorial staff, and the, the, the PR department doesn't even know what the curatorial values and beliefs are. The development office is trying to reshape those core values and beliefs to fit their fundraising case statements and activities. So oftentimes those are the key problems and they're never addressed because they're never stated candidly. Mm -hmm. So we go into a situation and we say let's increase candor by 30% and decrease collegiality by 30% and maybe <laughs> then we'll get a good analysis of your current situation. I mean you all know when you go into these meetings the real meeting happens outside. 
Yes. You come in and you have an hour long, very collegial, strategic meeting. Everybody is very happy and nice to each other. And then they go outside and pair up in twos and threes, and that's where the real meeting happens. I mean, that's where the real candid discussion uh, goes on. So I think an outside consultant is needed because it's hurtful. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's hard to take a hard look at yourself yeah. and your present condition. And so I think that's got to be done by an outsider. And I think also a willingness to change and a willingness to take criticism and say, all right, there are ways that this, you know, per, you know, my job personally or someone else's or the, or the institution in general, um, you have to be willing to say, I'll change or really look. One, one thing I like that you were saying, Sally, is the culture piece because culture is, can so often be broken. Um, the sort of values in the culture of an institution, and unless you can get those in line, you're really in trouble, no matter how beautifully written and well-crafted your strategic plan is. No, absolutely. You'll have internal cultural situations where, and, and this is at the Smithsonian, where you'll have curators who think, my job is to protect this collection over the next 30 years. Directors come and go. Strategic plans come and go. But my job is to protect this collection from these variables and these people who are coming in and coming out, I have to give constancy to this collection and its preservation. So they will resist any kind of strategic plan and they will think that nobody understands them and nobody understands what they're trying to do. So that internal culture, the attitude of the staff towards change, towards evaluation, towards self-criticism, towards learning, all of those internal cultural elements will participate in either having a successful or an unsuccessful strategic planning process and way of thinking. No, that cultural part about change is extremely important and how if you've had people who've been there a long time who actually wish not only would we not go forward but let's go back 20 years because that was well, the It's called the golden age syndrome. <laughs> when you interview for capacity analysis golden agers the golden age was when I set my own priorities. When I came in every morning and nobody bothered me and I could do whatever I wanted to and nobody was putting a clock on me, nobody was measuring the results of my work. I just could come in, set priorities, take my work day, do what I wanted. And that was the golden age. And then some director comes and says, we're going to do strategic planning and we're going to actually measure performance, measure outcomes, look at standards, create benchmarks, and all of a sudden that status quo guy says, I don't want to change. You know, I don't want to, I'm not buying into this new uh, way of thinking. So it, you really need to know who they are, where they are, and have methods to break up uh, covenant groups, these little groups of two and three who are really running the place. You got to figure out how to get into those covenant groups, crack them open, and get the strategic plan written that affects everybody. Great. So I guess sort of wrapping it up, where should it take place? Because you mentioned retreats. I know that's one place. I Obviously, there are on-site meetings, and so we can talk about that a little bit. Jay? One thing I find really valuable about half-day, maybe not necessarily full-day retreats, because sometimes that feels a bit onerous. You lose an entire work day. But I have, find, have found the good thing about being off-campus, so to speak, is it really puts you in a different um, mindset you have, uh, and I've often done it with people from the outside that are leading discussions. You break up into discussion groups. You know, you have a nice meal that you, you know. It just sort of, if you have a different environment, it can sort of um, get the creative juices flowing and have people interacting with other um, members of the staff that they would never have any reason to interact with. And having planned um, a number of half day and day-long retreats for the Clark for basically staff development, something we have called the um, leadership and culture team. I found those to be very valuable for the, in, in large part because you're interacting, as I said, with you know someone from grounds who you say hi to every day, but you maybe don't know what it is that they do or what they see as their goals for the institution. Um, so I think at, at some level, a retreat can be helpful. And then I think you know the, a, a lot of the work is done by a conference calls and, and, and meetings, so. Ali? Yeah, I would, I would agree with most of that. I, staffs oftentimes don't let down their hair and really talk to each other very much about the work. Um, you know, they will talk to each other about their families or their home or the or sports. Or, but just sitting down and talking about the work is relatively rare, especially cross-departmentally. 
Um, bonding, if, if, if your organization needs bonding, that is you've got curators who are hierarchically related to the educators, who are hierarchically related to the volunteers, and it's a very vertical uh, organization and you want to make it more horizontal and more of a cooperative horizontal uh, teams, then you've got to get off-site. Um, the, the second thing is sometimes the retreat is really just to build mutual trust, respect, and confidence mm -hmm. inside of the staff. It's don't put too much pressure on the retreat to make it the kind of we're going to write the mission statement together as a group of 20 and it just ends up getting frustrating and, and uh, the, the staff just gets bored. So if you're going to go off-site, make it fun. I mean, go to a fun place, make sure there's plenty of wine, Make sure there's plenty of time to kind of sit around. We didn't get any liquor on any of our retreats. Yeah, neither did we. <laughs> Absolutely. It's got to be fun. I mean, if, if there's one thing I hear from staffs when we walk in and say we're strategic planners is, oh, no, I did that once. It was so boring, and it was such a waste of time. Uh, and, and oftentimes they're absolutely right. So to me, the retreat is a necessary uh, team-building exercise or bonding exercise or cross-departmental communication coordination exercise. Don't put too much pressure on it to write the mission, to write the vision, to write the goals. To write. It's just to get the process started, to get people feeling like a team, you know, like we're in something together. So yes, I would do a, oftentimes do a retreat. Um, if not that, it's oftentimes uh, take a Saturday, do it in the museum, but make sure you give everybody Monday off um, so that it's, it's not, uh, you know, we strategic planning happens on somebody else's time. I mean, it happens on, on the organization's time. So if you're going to do it on site, uh, make it a weekend and then give them the following uh, a day off. And oftentimes in large organizations, it's the only time they really get to see each other is travel. It's either on a retreat or on a trip. And so retreats to me are important uh, bonding and, and consciousness raising exercises, but they need to be fun and they can't, they can't bear too much uh, weight in the process. Great. So far we've had no questions, so I don't know if uh, Meredith has seen any questions, because I haven't. Okay. Um, I think we do we have any final thank you Sully we're all going to go out and do three month strategic plans now <laughs> well, actually actually you know we often provide a getting ready for planning kind of work mm -hmm. for staffs to do together because I think staffs have got to get ready for and energetic about and used to what they're going to do in the planning process so you know, sending out uh, uh, kits to the board, sending out mm -hmm. kits to the staff so that they have the time to absorb what they're getting into and, and get enthusiastic about it. I mean, if, if most staffs dread the word strategic plan. I mean, they just know what it's going to be. It's going to be tedious, mm -hmm. uh, authoring of good intentions, um, and, 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 and always unrealistic. You know, I remember at the Smithsonian, we started the astral biology program at a strategic planning retreat. I kept saying to people, but we don't have any astrobiologists, we have no capacity, there's no debt, there's no program, there's no money. Why are we writing a strategic goal of, you know, make an astrobiology program? So the, the staffs have been there, and they know that many times the retreats are just happy talk and don't really have any consequences for their work life, so they just suffer through them. Uh, there must be consequences for the work life if the plan's going to be successful. Good. Well, and also you um, sent along a document, sort of a planning document that will be on the AMC website about called the strategic planning process, a short document to get people started. Yep. Wow. One thing I um, would just like to throw in is I think a strategic plan in some ways is only as good as you continue to revisit it and check yourself at Check what you're doing, what the goals were at every, you know, quarterly or ha have that, you know, with the board of trustees, with the management team, and then on a departmental level, whoever is the department head looking at those goals and saying, all right, have we met that or how are we going to meet that? Because if it otherwise, as Sally says, it ends up in a drawer and, it, and it's not useful. Okay. We just did get a question, by the way, Catherine, about how big an institution 
uh, do you have to be before you do strategic planning? Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. My answer would be, uh, it's a way of thinking. I don't think of strategic planning as a document or as, as a thing you put in a drawer or send out to staff. It's a way of thinking and, and getting together as a group and, and designing st strategic goals and directions and making sure you understand where you are. So it doesn't matter how big or small an organization. I mean, we, we've, we're a little boutique firm here and we have four people and we are doing strategic planning every day. Um, and so a small group, I think it's even more useful for a small group than a, a very large institution. So I don't think it's the size of the institution, it's just committing yourself to a way of thinking and managing your projects. So actually there are some questions. So I have one, who should oversee the outcomes of a strategic plan? In other words, who should keep tabs on the results? I guess from my point of view is that it, if you've disseminated your strategic plan and embraced it, it really should be um, a collective that is, um, and maybe there's always evaluation of whether the strategic plan is being implemented or as you say, it's being put into a drawer. Well, it totally depends on the size of an organization. Remember, a, a strategic goal at one level is a tactic at a lower, or a lower level. So it depends on the size of the organization. I mean, basically and ultimately, the director is responsible for achieving the strategic goals and directions of the plan. And, and the board, one of the only purposes of a board is to make sure that the uh, strategic directions and goals of the organization are correct. Um, but remember, I mean, this is absolutely critical. A strategic plan is written to be rewritten. It is not written to punish. It's not written to measure performance. It's not written to make sure Mary Jane gets fired. A strategic plan it should be rewritten every six months once you see what your actual progress has been on that goal. It should not be punitive. It should not be judgmental. That's not the purpose of a strategic plan. That's a performance evaluation program, totally different program. So overseeing it is really just a matter of making sure that it's up to date, that you've absolutely incorporated what you've accomplished, reduced expectations if necessary without thinking you've failed, but rather you, you set too high a mark, too, too high a benchmark in your first a strategic plan, so you have to alter it. But it has to be written and everybody has to agree. We're writing this to rewrite it. In six months, we'll get together, see how we're doing, and we'll adjust and adapt according to the environment that we're in, and we'll keep moving forward. So it, it, the overseeing should be done by everybody, every departmental manager, everybody who's responsible for outcomes should be aware of it, should know it, but it's not a, a punitive or a performance measuring device. Okay. And uh, we've had a couple of questions about sort of the size of the organization, and I think you sort of addressed that, that that could be of any scale. So I think we're... Uh, yes and no. The Smithsonian was too big for a strategic plan. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That is, when you try to do a strategic plan at that scale, you get you get strategic goals, understand the universe and its functioning, mm -hmm. and that's not much use, you no. know, in a in a strategic planning environment. Uh, so, very very large organizations oftentimes have to have multiple plans right. for multiple departments and outcomes. Mm -hmm. A mid-sized museum's perfect, small perfect, but if you're a very large organization, uh, think it through, think think how you're going to structure it so it's meaningful and doesn't just become happy talk that, that nobody pays any attention to. Great. This has been fascinating, I thought. Great information and very, very helpful. So Yeah, I've, I've learned a lot. Thank you. Oh, bye. <laughs> Great. Yep, and you guys, I, mean, I guess they've got our emails. We're glad to uh, respond to questions afterwards right. if we didn't, didn't get to them or didn't answer them in a satisfactory way. I'm more than glad to kind of uh, take emails and spread the word. Okay. Thank you both very, very much. You're welcome. Okay. Bye. Have a good Bye. afternoon, everyone. Thank you. <laughs>